And joining us now with a closer look at what the S&P upgrade means for the U.S. economy is Max Wolf. He's the senior analyst and chief economist at Greencrest Capital. Max, thanks so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. So what does it mean, the upgrade going now to stable? So I think there's the good news and the bad news. I think the S&P is acknowledging what many of us had sort of felt and seen in the data, which is the situation for the U.S. economy is certainly better in many ways than it was two years ago. On the other hand, we still have a dysfunctional political system, and so we're not getting upgraded back. We're getting a better outlook. So instead of a negative outlook, we're getting a neutral outlook. But we remain, again, now for two years in a row, pushing two years, after 70 years of a perfect credit rating, we remain one rung below. I think part of what we're seeing here is maybe a setup to raise in the future, but we're not there yet. So basically saying, don't expect to downgrade anytime soon, but neither are we going to see an upgrade in the near future either. Yeah, we got needs improvement and isn't all that great to needs less improvement, but still isn't all that great. So it's good news, but it doesn't necessarily a report card you put on the refrigerator. Right, exactly. So what are the chances and what needs to happen for the U.S. to reclaim it's a much-priced AAA outlook. I think we need to see more real, robust, sustainable economic growth without as much extraordinary stimulation from monetary policy authorities at the Fed. And we probably need to see a Washington policy that actually works, where the White House and Congress can come together and work out a budget agreement without screaming at each other and without potentially endangering the fiscal security of the United States in their inability to get along. Well, Washington and its political gridlock was the reason that the S&P downgraded uh, the credit rating back in 2011 because of the discussions about raising the debt ceiling. There's been some improvement there with regards to more tax revenue and such. So not, not good enough yet? Well, the macro economy has gotten a bit better, and I think that's wonderful. I don't know if we can really say Washington took us there or we got there despite them, but the bottom line is the ability of Congress and the White House to come together and cut a budget deal they both agree to is still missing in action. We're in this sequester now. We don't have a functioning budget agreement on a go-forward basis. So the political gridlock to me looks just as bad, but the macro economy has recovered a bit, hence the outlook being raised to neutral from negative. Well, let's explain what an outlook means. It means basically that if I lend you money, I have a better chance of getting that money back if the rating is AAA. I have the best chance of getting that money back. But considering the U.S. is still pumping out more and more and more and more debt, it still just owes even more people money than it did before. Yes, but our indebtedness is growing at a slower rate. I mean, again, soft solace, but, but it's solace. still growing. We, but it's still absolutely Every day growing. we owe more and more countries, people, more money. Yeah, every day we owe about a little bit more than $2 billion more than we owed the day before. So still growing at a pretty rapid clip. Absolutely true. But our ability to pay it back rises and falls with the macro economy, which is a bit more solid. And there's sort of two issues. The bizarre one of the United States is it's not just whether we could pay it back, but it's whether we're politically functional enough to pay it back. What we saw two years ago was a White House and a Congress that was willing to flirt with not being able to pay money back that they could afford just because they couldn't cut a deal. That's what freaked everyone out. But when you're printing your own money, as the U.S. economy does, you're always going to be able to pay it back. So... And it's, and it's the lesser of all evils, U.S. debt, comparing, as you said earlier, the, the cleanest dirty washing in a hamper full of dirty laundry. Right. Well, the United States is the cleanest dirty shirt. It looks more true. So the rest of the world, which looked relatively better on some sense a few years ago, looks a little less strong. The United States can always pay back, in part because of seniority. We print the global reserve currency. It's a powerful position to be in. However, the dysfunction in Washington was so great two years ago, and to some extent is still there, where even if we could pay it back, there's a sort of beginning of a risk that we might choose not to out of political dysfunction. And that really was the rationale for the S&P downgrade two years ago. So very quickly, what is now the biggest risk to U.S. debt going forward? I think there's a couple of things. A broad recovery in the emerging markets will make the lackluster returns on still somewhat risky U.S. debt very unappealing. In addition to which, given how dysfunctional Washington is, there's still the possibility that just to hurt each other, the Congress and the White House will play chicken with the global mm. and the U.S. economy. So bipartisan bickering, still our number one problem. Or knife fighting. Or it might be beyond knife bickering. fighting. Wow, <laughs> okay, taking it to a whole other level. Thank you so much, Max Wolf, Senior Analyst and Chief Economist at Greencrest Capital.